Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed, Don. Um, I always cause confusion by, by not having slides. Um, I did try for a while having slides, but I actually found that in an odd way they bifurcated attention. So there's a, a challenge to you is to, uh, or a challenge to me, is to make sense of what I'm, of what I'm saying. But uh, I've also got a, a visual aid, a different kind of visual aid, which we'll come to in a few minutes. But it is a genuine pleasure to have had the opportunity to speak to you this morning. As you just heard, I'm now well and truly retired from the movie industry. The vast majority of my work during these past dozen years has been in education, training, and public policy. I'm particularly proud to be engaged in development of policy around how we meet and hopefully defeat what may emerge as the greatest challenge the human race has ever faced, the one that we've rather limply come to call climate change. But even that has, so far, failed to distract me from spending most of my time continuing to work on a very broad range of education policy. As an aside, I should mention that I've just been appointed, because I was sitting around with nothing to do, uh, <laughs> to chair a government task force which will examine how we can best build on the UK's position in educational technology and the mar that marketplace and support the development of further opportunities overseas. What the government have recognised is that actually we're rather good at this stuff. It is a massive market and it's one that's sitting there uh, waiting for somebody to become the dominant player. It would be nice if it were us. What's brilliant about chairing uh, bodies like this and as Don just mentioned, I chair the Joint Parliamentary Climate Change Committee, is you, you, it's a marvellous learning opportunity. I mean, I get to meet, take evidence from, discuss and talk to people who I've never, ever in a million years get a chance to, uh, to come across. And uh, so rather selfishly, I'm afraid I tend to use these opportunities as, as a learning opportunity, not a, uh, uh, and far from finding it kind of grinding. Uh, as it happens... The power of technology to transform learning will be a thread that will run through pretty well the whole of what I'll have to say this morning. And as I hope will become clear, I see these twin strands of my work in education and climate change as inextricably linked. Because what's certain is that in this extraordinary fulfilling period of my life, I've been offered the opportunity to engage not simply with climatologists, but with people who every day of their working lives are attempting to mould what I've de described as the building blocks, the quality of which will, in every respect, determine the future of our planet. Now those building blocks are, for the most part, primary school children, and the people I spend much of my time with working with are their teachers. And if, as sadly I see it, the future looks increasingly like a war, and I prefer to that in your, the brochure, then this most recent generation of teachers are pretty well the only infantry we have. A generation of well-trained and confident teachers and learning and development professionals who are comfortable with the implications of living in a digital society but also keenly aware of the huge new challenges that that's likely to bring. And I think the only thing I would have added at the beginning when Don was asking about the future is the crucial to our ability to engage with the future is our ability to see change as an opportunity more than a threat. The truth of the matter is that's easier than it sounds because most people, when confronted with the idea of change, instinctively see it as threatening. And to actually have the, the courage and the vision, I think, to see change as a series of opportunities is, is tough. And it's one of the things that I think is part and parcel of what you're, I'm sure, attempting to pass on to the people that you train and deal with. Because for me, it is people like you who represent the most promising foundation on which I think we can build a sustainable society here in the UK, or for that matter, anywhere else in the world in this early part of, of the 21st century. Now, the war I just referred to is a war between what I see to be our largely failed present and the possibility of an altogether more imaginative future. And it's not simply that I want a more imaginative future, it's more the case that we have no future whatsoever, unless we're prepared to be a very great deal more imaginative than we've been in the past. Inevitably, what this will come down to is a battle between our worst and our better selves. And finding the prospect of playing to my, my own worst instincts deeply unattractive, I've been only too happy to throw my energy into improving the quality, the reputation, and the relevance of education. I am probably disproportionately influenced by um, a copy of Picture Post. Let's, let's try hands up anyone who's ever heard of Picture Post. That's not bad. Picture Post was the most popular, by a long way, the most popular weekly magazine in this country throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, it was kind of life magazine 
in, in, in those days, or Time magazine, I suppose, in those days. Um, in the week before I was born, I was born in February 41, so this is actually the late January 41 issue, um, they ran an entire issue, an entire issue of Picture Post, on building the future, what the future would be like after the war. It had been, the article, the whole thing had been premised on a letter to the editor from an out-of-work miner in Wales, effectively saying, what is the point of us fighting this war if all we're going to do is, at the end of it, go back to the world that existed pre-war? And this challenged the editor of Picture Post, a marvellous man called Tom Hutchinson, into commissioning a series of articles. Those articles, believe it or not, in this magazine, became the foundation stones of the welfare state. It was an article about what health should be like, what education should be like, what our built environment should be like, what social security, old age, should be like. And it always strikes me, and continues to strike me, that at a point in the war, and bear in mind, January 41, we were losing the war. There were very, very few people who were confident that we would emerge victorious. That at that extremely dire moment, a group of people had the guts to imagine what the future might be like and that it might be different and better. And I would commend that to you. I'm, I think you can get it online. But it's been an enormous source of strength to me that at the worst possible moments, human beings are able to imagine a better future. Um, 18 months ago, Michael Barber, who I worked with at, worked with at Number 10, and I decided to help create a movie. I can't pretend I produced it, but uh, we helped bring a movie into being, which we felt was a kind of learning skills and education version of Al Gore's uh, uh, An Inconvenient Truth. It was really done with the purpose of stimulating a debate and a discussion, because we thought that discussions around, particularly around education, had become stale and, and inward-looking. I'd like to show you, if I may, just the opening six minutes of, of that film. It was actually a giveaway in The Guardian a couple of months ago. Some of you may have seen it. The opening six minutes, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. Don, can I run that? Maybe if you were some spearheaded guy, I would listen to what you have to say. My number one priority for the next four years is to ensure that all Americans have the best education in the world. Ask me my three main priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education, and education. is facing huge challenges and they're growing daily in severity, in scale and in complexity. It's no exaggeration to say that they are not going to go away. Indeed, they will get worse unless we can start to find solutions and find them soon. If we're going to survive, we desperately need the next generation to be smarter, more adaptable and better prepared than any that have gone before. Our only chance is to improve the way we teach our young, to equip young people with the skills and attitudes that might steer this world of ours to a far safer place than at present looks likely. The question is, 
Is that what our current education system does? is a system that's shaped by historical forces, but they are now almost totally bankrupt as ideas for education in the 21st century. And I think they're betraying most of our children. Public systems of education paid for from taxation were invented to meet the needs of the industrial economy that was emerging in the 18th and 19th centuries, where we needed uh, a workforce who could do certain sorts of things. Our ordinary workmen have a tradition of skill behind them. The high schools of today were essentially designed in the 19th century, and they reached their zenith in the 1950s. In the old days, we say, one size fits all. OK, 30 kids, put them in a classroom. We're going to teach them the same material. You're all expected to get it the same way. Page 56, boy, page 56. There's a great emphasis on lining up and bells and, you know, these vast movements from room to room, a bit like um, movement of vast tribes, really, um, all at, at key times, bottlenecks, um, putting children in age cohorts, regardless of whether that's got any purpose at all. In the old days, it used to be the teacher as the, the man or woman, the person up front who knows it all. And here are these young people who are listening to this person who knows it all and and they take it all in, and if, if it's a good teacher, you know, you all get it and you move on. I won't forget to tell you when it's time to stop, lad. There's a tendency to look backwards. Thank you, sir. And always to say, well, there was a golden age of education, and if we just get back to that, you know, everybody will be absolutely fine, all wearing blazers and, you know, boaters and sort of doing reading, writing, arithmetic. Potty bam, potty bass, potty bat. <laughs> <laughs> Potty bam, potty bass, potty bat, cricket bat. Schools become steeped in history, in the past, in static knowledge, and fail to capture the here and now. And schools often fail to prepare young people for contemporary society, for the realities of the world in which we are living. And even more significantly, fail to prepare young people for the emerging issues of our time. How is this helping our children in terms of what they're going to be as adults? in 25 years' time, a time we don't really know what it's going to be like. How adaptable are they going to be? How versatile are they going to be? Um, and how confident are they going to be? Students who are starting school this year will are likely to be retiring around 2065. Given that we can't predict with any certainty what the world's going to look like in 10 years or even perhaps five years, the very best that we can do is prepare young people for a rapidly changing social, technological, economic environment, that they'll need to be the most flexible, collaborative, resilient, creative generation that really have ever been. Education is, is I really think, the most fundamental challenge facing human beings, you know, and that, that education will be the key to solving all of the other problems that we've got. If, as I see it, we truly are prepared to take on the immense challenges of the 21st century, then I believe we've no choice but to embrace the equally immense power of the most recent digital technologies in learning at every single level. And to do so in a way that makes our present rate of progress look exactly what it is, and that's to say pitifully inadequate. Let's face it, in many respects, life in the UK, as in most other parts of the world, has been quite literally transformed just in the past 20 years. Digital technology, whether it's mobiles, the internet, or video games, has fundamentally reshaped the way in which people of every age connect, make sense of, and engage with society. Rightly or wrongly, people expect an entirely new form of relationship with the world around them, one that doesn't simply rely on accessing information, but on creating new knowledge, new products, and even, at times, new resources. Learning's no longer something that needs to happen within particular hours, in a particular place, or even 
with a particular group of people. The immense power of the World Wide Web means that a fantastic knowledge resource is just a click away in schools, colleges, homes, on the move, to the extent that anyone with an internet connection has the power to access this extraordinary treasure trove of knowledge within quite literally seconds. Any time, any place, the world's digital library is always open. Yet, it's equally true that the existence of this extraordinary cornucopia of knowledge makes the need for teachers and mentors, in essence, trusted learning guides, more crucial than ever. Young people, in particular, may be very smart about using the technology, a good deal smarter than most of us, I suspect, but they need help. They need help in assessing what's valuable and what's useless and what's good and what's bad. They need help in sifting the wheat from the chaff. And as I see it, that's our job. And in such a society, access to communications is no longer confined to some small elite. Anyone can join a social network or set up a blog and potentially reach out to other interested souls pretty well anywhere in the world. Now, needless to say, there's a downside. All too often it feels as though the loudest voices succeed in drowning out the most reasonable, the thoughtful, the moderate. Sometimes to a point at which you want to literally scream with frustration. Many of the comments put up in relationship to newspaper articles and video clips on YouTube would appear to demonstrate the presence of a kind of digital lynch, no, digital lynch mob, a new and ever more present threat, and one that needs to be guarded against vigilantly. Uh, vigilantly? Got there. A digital society is or should be just that, a society, a society in which we thoughtfully balance our rights with our responsibility to respect and learn from others. Civil society cannot possibly afford to be reduced to some anachronistic free-for-all. Surely we need to create learning environments in which informed responses to the challenges of the 21st century are encouraged and nurtured. And this would be a world in which prejudice and ignorance would hopefully become rather better understood for exactly what they are. As I suggested a little earlier, the crucial factor in creating this responsible learning environment is a successful and confident education and training system and outstanding professionals within it. Here's what three public figures had to say about the impact of an extraordinary teacher upon their own lives in an article in last week's Guardian. Some of you may have read it. First, the author and actor, Alexi Sale. When I was at Foundation Art College at Southport, there was a teacher there called Max Eden who'd known Picasso in the 1950s. He was wonderfully dismissive about things like art A-levels. Just draw the fingernails and you'll pass, he said. But he also showed me how the way you lived your life could in itself be a work of art. I love that notion of one's life having the potential to be a work of art. It's a really beautiful and very valuable thought. Now is Rory Brenner talking about his French teacher, a man named Derek Swift. He was unconventional, original and inspiring, constantly inventing his own teaching materials and covering the whiteboard with words and phrases in anything from German to Serbo-Croat and using Asterix and other comic strips as learning aids, he also introduced me to Voltaire's novel, Candide, and therefore to satire. And lastly, and to me the best of all, here's what the former poet laureate Andrew Motion had to say. I was taught English by Peter Way, Mr. Way to me, and it was as though he'd walked into my head and turned all the lights on. He didn't know he was doing it, but he gave me my life. So Mr. Way walked into his head and turned all the lights on. Anyone in this room who's experienced anything like the impact of a brilliant teacher, mentor, can, I'm certain, entirely identify with that. As all the interviews in that particular article underlined, teachers and the right kind of support really matter. It's learning professionals, not the technology, which account for the crucial difference between raising the bar and allowing it to remain in the same depressing place it's always been or to be strictly accurate, it's the skilled teacher, adept at handling the very best technology, that's rapidly becoming society's single greatest asset. That's why professionals such as yourselves will come to matter more than ever in an advanced digital society. In essence, this means putting learning, that's to say the acquisition of understanding, right back where it belongs at the very center of all of our concerns. For if learning finds itself at the heart of the new digital world, then it follows that the type of learning professionals and teachers I'm describing are its lifeblood, whether in the workplace or in schools and colleges. In reality, learning and a commitment to professional development remain the key to all of our futures. In fact, without 
good and confident teachers, I'm not sure we have that much of a future at all. And in a world increasingly dominated by Google, Apple, Facebook and so on, it pays to constantly remind ourselves that no training system in the world can ever be better than the quality of its average teacher. Every piece of social research that I've read in the past dozen years affirms and reaffirms that fact. So I don't think the importance of good teaching and training will change one bit. But I do think that our definition of what makes a good teacher or learning professional is likely to change a very great deal. Of course, leadership, knowledge, the ability to inspire and arouse curiosity, those attributes will always endure. Those who teach and train will still need to be coaches and colleagues and friends, but in addition to those qualities, the daily substance of their professional skill base is likely to alter, if for no other reason than to reflect the very rapidly changing expectations of the people you work with. Only by engaging with the new and at times quite intimidating challenges presented by the digital age and applying them to the process of teaching and learning in the workplace and in schools and colleges, are we likely to produce a generation of creative people with a breadth and depth of understanding capable of dealing with this new and incredibly difficult century of ours. And that's exactly what that film is about. We are asking a generation of young people to be smarter, cleverer, more adaptable, work in teams and deal with problems the like of which we, fortunately, certainly people of my age, have never confronted. The problem is we've left them the legacy of these problems. I'd like to draw on a parallel from my experience of working with schools, particularly schools. Here in the UK, there are now plenty of schools working with organisations like FutureLab, which I have the privilege of chairing, to develop classroom practices and new approaches to curriculum design which are underpinned by the aim of supporting young people to become informed and literate digital participants. That's a terribly important phrase, informed and literate digital participants. We've got quite a thing going on at the moment in the House of Lords as a digital economy bill goes through trying to lay a significant amount of stress on the nature of digital literacy and the fact that actually literacy in the 21st century is likely to come to mean something somewhat different to what it meant to we who were educated in the mid-20th century. Kids are going to have to understand and be able to interpret images in a way that we were not required to. Initiatives have been developed within schools that twin the application of new media for learning with fresh thinking about the curriculum and teaching practices. For example, by conducting historical inquiry via online archives, by interpreting and producing literary hypertext, by testing and constructing science simulations, all of which quite inevitably challenge what we teach, as well as how it's taught, and even in some cases, why it's taught. Let me offer an example of what I mean in relation to both the opportunities and the challenges that I'm describing, by looking through the prism of an issue that affects every person in this room, no matter where you're from, namely climate change, and in particular, a simulation game that's being developed for us here in the UK. What's been fascinating to me, but maybe less surprising to many of you, is that the very first thing kids do when they get hold of these games is destroy the planet. <laughs> Only when they've done that a couple of times and looked hard at the repercussions do they then go back, and maybe the third or fourth time around, begin to look at the issues involved in building an infinitely more sustainable model. In many respects, this is little short of a revolution in the way we learn. For a start, it's a lot less didactic, because instead of saying to kids, this is the way to do it, you're in effect saying, here are the tools and here are your options. It's the equivalent, if you like, of learning to use a flight simulator. You take off, you try to stay in the air and eventually land safely and indeed in the right place. Assessment is immediate and utterly self-evident. Safe flight and landing success, crash, and you failed. Kids don't need to be told whether they've succeeded or not. And if they failed, their most likely response, in my experience, is to want to try again and again and again until they succeed. Now, in real life, that's exactly how we all learn. In fact, it's, people have, it's the way in which people have always learned. But oddly, and this is purely my own observation, that type of thinking never seems to have quite transmitted itself into the established world of teaching and learning. Games, and crucially their interactive dimension, provide us with the opportunity of looking at things as they are or even were, and then through reassembling the digital toolbox, they uniquely offer a sense of how they might be. You could call these games ethical and moral laboratories. As I see it, the development of this type of content affords a richness of imaginative thinking and the opportunity to learn of a type that was lost many, many years ago when we stopped making things with our hands. 
by what we then used to call trial and error. And again, as I see it, what's true of learning in schools is every bit as true for learning in the workplace, in fact, for learning of any kind whatsoever. Technologies handed us the opportunity to actively engage learners, to finally escape from the passive world of chalk and talk, which remains, even in 2010, an all-too-familiar model of teaching and learning practice throughout a great deal of the world. It's my sincere belief that today's digital media could have an enormously valuable impact in addressing many of the difficulties that lie ahead of us, simply by more effectively spreading knowledge and understanding of the sheer complexity and interconnectedness of the physical world. I believe, for example, that intelligently developed digital media offer a serious opportunity to help influence all manner of behavioural change. Uniquely, what we call games allow the possibility of creating differing scenarios to illustrate severe alterations in climate and their likely variable impact upon ourselves and our planet. If genuine creativity is brought into play, the possibilities in terms of richness and breadth of content contained in just this one example alone are, in my judgment, almost boundless. We in the developed world find ourselves in an environment literally saturated with moving and interactive images. They're the dominant means by which we increasingly learn about, understand, and hopefully begin to make sense of the world. And in this new learning environment, mass participation in creating, sharing, and reusing images has taken hold on a quite extraordinary scale. Our task is surely to harness these opportunities in addressing the many longer-term challenges that, as a global and digital society, we now face. And with these long-term objectives in mind, allow me to finish with a bit of tough love by reassessing what I see as the crucial lessons we ought to have absorbed during these past 30 years, certainly if we wish to address the question of what sort of society we want to be as we face this very difficult world. Firstly, like it or not, getting our education and training systems right is not just one amongst a whole slew of problems. In reality, it's the whole ball of wax. Secondly, and at risk of repeating myself, no education and training system can be better than the teachers and the learning professionals it employs and the standards that it sets them. Thirdly, the quality of training of those professionals in a digital age has to be viewed as an entirely non-negotiable and continuing process. The commitment of governments to the best possible quality of training, along with regular, preferably annual timeout for professional development, must be absolute. And finally, although I could go on, people of every age learn best and teach best in environments which respect them and what they do, environments which reflect the best of the built structure that surrounds them. No more learning in inadequate buildings with outside toilets and poor light. It doesn't work. And in referring to infrastructure, I most specifically include every aspect of connectivity and its complementary tools in the form of hardware and software. Now, the good news is that there are really excellent people in this country who understand that education and training at every level is both the cause and the consequence of any possibility of national renewal. I desperately want this country to emerge from its present crisis as a more successful and sustainable society. That's why I came here this morning, to argue that in these incredibly challenging times, the ability to deliver a world-class education and training system will come down to a simple test of national will. Do we have the courage and the imagination to seriously invest in the future, to build upon our reputation for creativity and ingenuity in offering our people far greater opportunities in this digital age. In fact, do we have the same courage, vision, and determination that was illustrated in that article in Picture Post I referred to in January of 1941? They wished to do it, and in many respects, they succeeded in doing it. Do we have the same degree of guts? I happen to think we do, but time will tell. Thank you very much for listening to me.